Why do we want to be immortal? The main reasons for our need of immortality are the fear of death and the unknown, the fact that we want to experience everything our world has to offer, and the fact that we want to be remembered and we want to leave something behind. We have decided to study this and its different manifestations through time with regards to the English culture. From a psychological point of view, the need of immortality is a basic need of mankind. It stems for our, from our instinct of preservation, and it makes us want to leave something behind and be remembered. Carl Gustav Jung, the founder of analytical psychology, talks about the need of immortality in his writings, stating that it is a perfectly normal psychic phenomenon that cannot be proved in any way. And he gives an example of uh, our need of immortality through the myth of Gilgamesh. This myth has been cited as one of the first stories which have been recorded of our human history, dating back to 2000 BC. The myth of Gilgamesh sees the protagonist, Gilgamesh, who is the king of Uruk, um, <clears throat> who was said to marry a Nipo woman in rank named Ishtar. However, the gods created the wild beast Enkidu as a rival to Gilgamesh because he was an oppressive ruler. Gilgamesh and Enkidu first fight each other, but then become close friends. After some time, Gilgamesh refuses to marry Ishtar, so she sends someone to kill Enkidu, Gilgamesh's friend. And um, Gilgamesh is very upset because of his friend's death, so goes on a long and distant journey to find the secret of eternal life from a man named Udnapishtim, who gives Gilgamesh a secret plant that can restore youth. Gilgamesh goes back to Uruk happy with this plant, however, it gets stolen by a snake along the way. So Gilgamesh has to go back home empty handed, but he is wiser because he has understood that immortality is unattainable and he has accepted his mortal fate. Moving on to the classical era, um, man has more faith in his capabilities and also relies on the gods to achieve good fortune. And this is reflected in the writings of the time. Homer is the legendary author of the two most famous epic poems of the um, ancient Greek literature, the Iliad and the Odyssey. I have chosen these poems because the author, Homer, gives very clear examples of mankind's need of immortality through his characters, in particular the two protagonists, Achilles and Odysseus. In the Iliad, Achilles knows that he has a limited life because he is mortal, and so decides to do everything he can to attain everlasting honor. This is the reason why he goes to fight in the Trojan War, not because the Trojans were his enemies, but because he wanted to attain fame and glory. Odysseus thinks that his main pursuit in life is fame and glory, and this is why he goes on a journey himself and also does very dangerous acts that could be considered unnecessary. For example, when he yells back to the Cyclo Cyclops Polyphemus, or when he tells Alcinus and his course his whole story, to make him immortal in the minds of men. Um, also, that the most important element here is that while in the myth of Gilgamesh, the hero does everything he can in order not to die, here, both heroes have already accepted their mortal fate from the beginning, and this is why they try to achieve immortality through uh, great acts that will, that will make them famous. Also, in the classical era, we have Horus, the leading Roman lyric poet during the time of Augustus. In his odes, Horus discusses what will set him apart from both common people and the other poets. And in Ode 3.30, he, um, he creates a capstone to his work. He gives two images of physical lasting things, which are bronze and pyramids, and he states that his poetry will be able to last longer than these two things and will not fall to the effects of time. The most important part of this ode is where the poet states that I will not wholly die. He is saying that he will, he will continue to live forever through his poems. And this decision is what brings many poets and writers nowadays to create autobiographical works in order to leave some part of them behind and be remembered forever. Talking about the immortality in the Middle Ages, 
We have to say that the, the Middle Ages is a start period that developed from the 5th century to the 15th century. And uh, it, is, it was characterized by the people at the time that were insecure and sensible, and that they used to buy a lot of religious items in order to feel themselves more safer from the enemies of the time, and also to try to reach God and immortality. Talking about uh, the film that I've analyzed, uh, The Seventh Seal, it is a film that is uh, located uh, in the Middle Ages. It speaks about uh, uh, my, oh, sorry, I've sorry, uh, analyzed a uh, scene specifically of this film. That's the block, uh, the knight, uh, and also the protagonist of uh, this film, and uh, movie, fighting against uh, the death by Tony Chess. This scene can be also seen as a fight between the man who wants to continue to live and the, the death who wants to put an end to his life. Um, in this film, uh, apart uh, the knight, uh, we have also a lot of uh, medieval features, like for example the game of the chess, that represent the medieval society because of the presence of the king, the queen uh, and other type of people. But uh, the most important thing of this scene is that uh, the man doesn't surrender to death. He wants to continue to play this game because he wants to live uh, forever and to be mortal. Another important theme of the, of the Middle Ages that I've analyzed uh, is the Gothic architecture. It is a type of architecture developed in France from the 12th century to the 16th century. And that has a, as a most important characteristics, the buildings that were uh, high, this because uh, of the uh, will from the people to reach God, uh, and so the paradise, obviously, metaphorically, to feel themselves more safe. Uh, the, the Gothic architecture has also a lot of uh, important uh, features. For example, as you can see, the flying buttress located uh, alongside uh, the buildings. The point dark that influences uh, the vaulted ceiling that uh, is uh, an important feature because it gave uh, the buildings uh, more um, more importance, more uh, more elegance. But also the dark walls, creature located also outside uh, the buildings in order to have uh, an educational purpose. And also another important uh, theme of the, of the Gothic architecture can be seen in the English Gothic architecture. It is a specific type uh, of uh, the Gothic architecture that developed in England from 1180 to 1520. And whose most important example in England, obviously, can be considered the Westminster Abbey. It has been built, um, rebuilt uh, several times in its history. For example, between uh, 1042 and 1052, in 1245 by Henry III, who gave him a, a, most, a more English Gothic uh, style, and between uh, 1245 and 1517, here, so uh, it has been completed by another architect. Considering its structure, instead, uh, we have to say that uh, three architects supervised uh, his work, its works. They were Henry of Reims, who took the, the inspiration from the French cathedrals of uh, Reims and Chartres and who borrowed from them uh, some uh, Gothic features, like for example the um, pointed arcs or the rose windows, the Sucoli del Rosone. And the exterior instead, uh, as I said, it has been rebuilt in several times, uh, this because of uh, decay and pollution. Today I'm going to talk about the linemen in comparison with the first Romanticism. The 18th century in England was called Augustan after the Roman period of history, which had achieved the political stability and power as well as a flourishing of the art. It was an age of traditionalism but was a distinctive moment in the making of, uh, of England. People trusted their reason and their common sense and the rational trend was a feature of the period that is also called the age of reason. Social behavior was corrected and a great emphasis was laid upon sociability, politeness and the art of conversation. 
The Enlightenment had brought uh, tolerance uh, and uh, recognition of the value of a cultural society, but this supremacy of a reason had led to the repression of emotions and feelings. The last uh, 30 years of the 18th century are referred to as the early Romantic Age, in which there was a major interest in a sing singular inspiration and individual response. Uh, this change was produced by many factors, such as uh, the noisy activity of the town was compared uh, with the serenity of the countryside, uh, growing interest in humble and everyday life, uh, and also the love for the ruins. Uh, the classical concept of nature as a set of divine laws established by God was slowly replaced by the view of nature as a real and living being to be described as it really was. A new aesthetic theory was built on individual consciousness rather than on the imitation of the precept of nature and of the classics. The most uh, remarkable work on the subject uh, was written by Edmund Burke, a philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas uh, uh, of the sublime and the beautiful, in, uh, in which he gave uh, supremacy to the sublime over the beautiful. The passion caused by the wit and sublime in nature is uh, also called uh, astonishment, the state of the soul in which all its emotions uh, are suspended with uh, some degree of hope. Of our world. Whatever therefore is uh, terrible is sublime too, and to produce it, uh, obscurity seems to be necessary. Uh, romanticism implies also the use of imagination as a means uh, to give an expression to the, to the emotional uh, experience not strictly accountable uh, to reason. And uh, also, the romanticism instead the uh, Augustan age, uh, where a man had seen as a social animal, saw him essentially in the solitary state and saw the special qualities of each individual's mind. The current of thought represented by Jean-Jacques Rousseau encouraged the notion that the natural and impulsive behavior is good in contrast to that is governed by rules, uh, reason, and uh, customs of society. Now I'm going to analyze two of the most important masterpieces of the that belong to Romanticism. Uh, the shipwreck painted uh, by William Turner in 1805 and uh, the Hay Wayne by John Constable painted in 1821. During his uh, long career, Turner stayed uh, faithful to the genre of landscape and began to pay more attention to the effects of light and, uh, and color. In the English art romantic period, uh, dreadful uh, catastrophe, natural phenomena, and shipwreck became a popular theme. In the, in the shipwreck uh, is represented the inferiority of man versus nature, and uh, Turner's desire was to portray the, the power of the element and how no one can do anything against uh, an angry sea. The main focus of the calamity is concentrated in the center of the canvas so where the crew awaits their fate in destiny because they are powerless against uh, the storm's anger. The shining uh, sail is the only element of light uh, that contrasts between uh, the against the dark of the sky and the fury of the sea. Constable's uh, work uh, focused on the natural English uh, landscape uh, and rebelled against the neoclassical style uh, which had used the nature to display historical and uh, mythical scenes. In the Hay Wayne, uh, Constable painted a raw landscape uh, which runs uh, into the distance in sun drenched meadows. The predominant uh, tones uh, are those natural and um, and the different tones are repeated to add the harmony to this piece. In fact, the blue of the pool is reflected in the sky, and the red of the house is stressed in the trees and in the harness of the horse. One of the most innovative techniques introduced by Constable was to create light on the water by using the white paint as a highlight, and this can be seen in the hay wain because uh, as uh, the water from the stream is, uh, is disturbed by the will of the hay wain uh, itself. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the late Romantic period. 
Uh, the key points in the, late, in the late Romantic period are technology and science uh, advances, the rejection of human limits and death, and um, the Industrial Revolution and the search and desire of infinity and immortality. The new advances and the discoveries and the resulting new sciences and technology led to the birth of a new movement, Positivism in 1830. Positivism states that knowledge derives from natural, natural phenomenon and from sensory experiences. Uh, the late Romantic period um, is marked by a taste of fear and terror, and this phenomenon is reflected also in literature. Uh, the, the Gothic novel flourished in Great Britain between 1760 and 1820, and anything is characterized by terror, pain, power, fear, and a sense of immortality and infinity. Um, other characteristics uh, are that uh, also the sitting um, uh, has uh, an atmosphere of fear and terror. Then uh, all the characters uh, are dominated by exaggerated uh, reaction, are uh, rejected uh, by the society and persecuted by a villain. And the villain is the embodiment of evil. Then there is the presence of supernatural beings uh, and um, uh, science and technology, and we find also the presence of uh, the concept of uh, limitless potential individual, and terror is one of the ways of realizing that potential. One of the most important Gothic novels in this period is Frankenstein. Frankenstein was written in 1816 by Mary Shelley and then published in 1818. But which was the purpose of Dr. Frankenstein? Igor and I stand upon the cusp of Creating life out of death. Mr. Frankenstein. Victor, Victor, please. I find your promise more than a little unsettling. You will speak up, what do you think? Everyday science and technology changes the way we live our lives. Well said, that man. Life and death are different. I dream of a world where hope replaces fear. A world where a murdered man can stand in court to face his murderer, where a crippled soldier, shrapnel in his spine, can be killed healed, then brought back to life to walk again. Life is beautiful. Now tell me what that says. Death. Thank you very much. I cannot argue with that. There it is, black and white, but with a little applied science. <laughs> life. So Frankenstein was a Swiss scientist and he managed to create a human being by joining different parts of uh, selected corpses, but um, uh, its result was uh, um, was uh, really ugly and revolting because the monster became some murderer and in the end uh, destroys also his creator. Uh, we found different things uh, in Frankenstein. One, uh, one of them is the, um, the mad scientist. The term already existed, but started being used during the late Romantic and after Mary Shelley's novel. Mad scientist refers to an inventor who is insane and whose madness endangered himself and other people. Frankenstein fits the description because his creation endangered himself and other people and his purpose was insane. Uh, then we have monstrosity. Monstrosity lies in the center of the novel. Uh, the monster is rejected from the society and um, his, most, his uh, monstrosity results from his, his appearance because it's very ugly, from the inside, uh, from his soul because uh, he um, hates himself and other people and also from the unnatural manner of his creation. Dr. Frankenstein is considered a monster too because uh, um, his purpose alienates him from the society. And some critics uh, have defined also the entire novel as monstrous because different texts and tenses are combined. Um, then we have also the, the dangerous knowledge, the natural selection and anatomy. Uh, there is also the presence of technology and science, uh, and particularly of uh, chemistry and uh, electricity, which were new advances and discoveries. In fact, uh, Fra uh, Frankenstein used uh, electricity and um, chemistry to create his monster. Uh, 
Uh, finally, uh, we can uh, make a parallel between Frankenstein and uh, Prometheus. Prometheus was a Greek myth and he steals the sacred fire from uh, goods and from the Mount Olympus and give it to human, humans. Um, as the same did Frankenstein because um, he wanted to overcome human limits <coughs> and, and uh, to break the laws of nature and circle of life and it give, uh, he gives to humans what before had belonged, uh, had belonged only to, the, to God, that is immortality. As we could understand, immortality states for an everlasting life. This ancient concept has defined human history from its very beginning, when myths were told and when men's royal gesture were passed down from generation to generation. Immortality clearly reflects the profound human desire to deny its mortality. It implies a continuous struggle with death and the attempt to win over it. Nowadays, in the past decades actually, technology has become a turning point because it clearly adapts the reality to people's needs and desires. In fact, the science, scientific communities and researchers in the field believe that technology makes indefinite human lifespan within human reach in two main ways. So we can recognize web immortality and scientific immortality. But what do we mean by web, immor by web immortality? Technology has created a digital world where everyone connected to an internet provided device can stay alive even after its physical death. This means that people have the possibility both of their last words. Saying the social media sites keep you alive even after your physical death is quite shocking, but at the same time it is significant because it perfectly reflects the human feeling of yearning more. And the way to satisfy this desire is quite easy and also not ex expensive. People just need to sign up to a dead social, a free online service. And a well-known case of web immortality is Lawrence Dorani's story. Due to his lung condition, he has a two years lifespan. But after his death, the so-called executor will share his life on this website, making him immortal. This phenomenon is strictly related to the irreversible destiny of dying. Here deaths appear as the path toward immortality. Actually, the reason why immortality is so alluring to human mind is because death has always been something mysterious, something out of control. But man's behavior changes if we are aware of the fact that we can at least decide virtually our end, and this idea is comforting. Then we have scientific immortality. What do we mean <coughs> by scientific immortality, and is it finally in the 21st century within human reach? Technology has made huge achievements in the medical field, making immortality within our reach. Scientists and researchers in the fields argue that the aging process is a social constructure, not a natural law, so as a disease it can be challenged. For the moment, science is achieving huge advances in two main fields. So we have regenerative and anti-aging medicine by which we can build up the stem cells and their ability to reproduce multiple times seems the answer to preserve human life. Then we are assisting of one of the most sci-fi scenarios, so we can recognize a digital immortality related to nanomedicine. Their aim is to realize a full human artificial intelligence, so we could be so-called AI. From all these scientific considerations, we can lead to a major business problem. In the future, a company will definitely chase after this immortality business, but we are still uncertain if all this business is going to be affordable for all population or just for few ones. Now, in the modern days, the most affordable way to defeat death and to reverse the aging process is plastic surgery. From a social point of view, plastic surgery represents perfectly the idea of immortality, this human idea to, of yearning more. But can we consider all this scientific <coughs> innovation related to the concept of immortality a real progress? The answer is a no. Based on the information provided by the 21st century medicine, technology is an appealing option in order to lead to, lead, sorry, to reach an indefinite human lifespan. But this longevity also brings up ethical issues as well as a social impact. The carrying capacity of all of Earth won't be able to sustain an endlessly increasing population. This kind of population will lead to huge unemployment problems 
and it also will be difficult to manage both the younger and the older population. In this kind of situation, competition and conflicts will escalate, and as a result, we will live in a world where diplomacy between states won't exist. So we can understand and we also have to underline how controversial the human behavior is in relation to the concept of immortality. Actually, we are living in a society which can be considered a death-denying reality. And this reality is going to use every possible means in order to achieve an indefinite life expectancy. But what we are doing now is actually leading us to the very opposite ending, so a world where no human being will exist.